Hi everybody, this is Kevin, and welcome back to another video. And today, I'm going to be sharing my thoughts on The Legend of Heroes Trails in the Sky first chapter, which originally released in 2004 in Japan, and is the start of the epic Trails, otherwise known as Kiseki series. But before I get into the actual review, I just want to give you a brief history of the Trails Kiseki series and how I learned about it. And it all starts with Trails of Cold Steel 1, which was a game that was recommended to me around two or three years ago by my friend Nuke. And he said, you know, Kevin, you love JRPGs, so try Trails of Cold Steel, you're going to love it. Now, two to three years later, I still haven't played Trails of Cold Steel 1. As is the case with most of us gamers, we pick up games on sale, we get recommendations, and then they just sit there in the backlog waiting to be played because there's all the new releases, there's the other games in the backlog. You know the drill. But as I played other games, I continued to hear about how great the Trail series is, how all the characters have these excellent backstories and everything that happens in them, the plot twists, the music, everything about the game is, is just great. So I, I've heard <laughs> the praises from the high heavens. So one of these days I was bound to try them. And as I learned more about the Trails games, I learned that the Cold Steel games take place toward the end of the story, and it's better off to start with the Trails in the Sky trilogy, then move on to the Crossbell duology, then the four Trails of Cold Steel games. Later on in July, we're going to get the release of Trails into Reverie, the supposed epilogue, although after Trails into Reverie, we have the two Kuro no Kaseki games waiting to be localized, and then you better believe there's going to be even more Trails games after that, because why wouldn't there be? So I decided to start with the very beginning, and 50 hours later, I absolutely love it, and I can't wait to, to play second chapter, which, at the time of recording this video, I'm taking a bit of a break, but probably by the time this video goes up, I'll already be like 10 hours into second chapter. So, <laughs> you know, it's going to happen sooner or later. And another thing with this video, it's going to be hopefully one of my better videos. I'm going to heavily edit it and, and include all sorts of graphics and whatnot. So I hope you guys enjoy. Uh, just be aware, there will be timestamps in the description of when I get into spoilers because, you know, we'll keep it sort of vague in the beginning, but I have to talk about the spoilers and particularly the final chapter and what happens in the last two hours of the game because I have so many questions. <laughs> but anyway, hope you guys enjoy the video. Bills in the Sky first chapter. Where to even begin? Well, I guess I'll start with a bit of background and how the game takes place in the Liberal Kingdom, which is bordered by the Erebonian Empire in the north and the Calvert Republic in the east. And around 10 years ago, there was a war called the Hundred Days War, in which the Erebonian Empire was on the verge of victory against the Liberal Kingdom. However, one man known as Cassius Bright, the Divine Blade, was able to turn the tide of battle and help the Liberal Kingdom win with the help of Alan Richard and Commander Morgan. And then you get a scene that says five years ago, you know, taking place in the current timeline, five years ago, Cassius rescuing this young boy named Joshua, who ends up becoming his adoptive son. We also meet Estelle Bright, his daughter by blood, and you get a really humorous scene where Estelle is yelling at her father, like, what are you doing bringing home a boy? What is this about? And starts like kicking the injured Joshua and it's like, Estelle, what are you doing, girl? But to me, this scene was meant to establish how expressive all the characters can be. Not only from the, the portraits when they talk with the dialogue, you know, they make all these different faces from frowns to smiles, blushes, crying, you name it. There, there has to be hundreds of different expressions. But also the, the chibi pixel characters, the mannerisms they have, the amount of detail in the architecture of the houses, the fireplace, the books, everything. Like, there's so much detail in every scene in, in this game, and it's, it's really a sight to behold. But then you get a, a, a thing that comes up, it says five years later, Estelle and Joshua are both 16 now, ready to become junior bracers, following in their father Cassius's footsteps. And then we meet this other woman named Sherizard, who goes by Shera. Kind of a goofy name, Sherizard, but, you know, she's cool. She is a, a higher-ranked bracer than Estelle and Joshua, obviously, but lower than the esteemed Cassius Wright. 
And she starts by giving Estelle and Joshua odd jobs. They got to go into the sewers and fight these monsters. And that establishes the Bracer Guild, how that's your means of advancing the plots. But you can also accept a wide variety of side quests from slaying the random monsters to escorting a character through the dungeon to finding a little boy's ring, whatever. There's all these different quests to do. And as you complete side quests as well as main quests, all of the NPCs' dialogue constantly changes, and it adds so much to the story. Just these little things from, you know, you can go to the shop and buy issue two of the newspaper to um, this character you meet early on is, is talking about the fishing guild to actually seeing the fishing guild later on. It, it's just quite impressive and worth it to talk to every NPC multiple times if you can. So, you know, Estelle and Joshua do these odd jobs. Shara joins them in the party. And they end up, you know, fighting these monsters and, and seeing what they need to do. The, the prologue chapter ends, and they learn that Cassius has left on business via the airship, uh, leaving behind a letter as well as this artifact known as the Black Orbament, which becomes very important for later on. So Cassius gives Estelle and Joshua his blessing to go around the kingdom, go to all the towns, and become junior bracers which is what they decide to do. But as they continue exploring, they learn that one of the airships has been hijacked by the Sky Bandits, later on revealed to be the Kapua family. And so, hearing that one of the airships was hijacked, they're like, oh no, Dad was on that airship, we gotta go do something. So as, as they get involved in, in the greater story and confront the Sky Bandits, they figure out that the whole crew is there, but Cassius Bright never went on the airship and, and went by other means. So, what is their dad doing? What is what is his secret? And as they fight the Kapua family, it turns out that uh, as they fight them, they're really dark, particularly the, the father, or rather the older brother of the group, Don, who's like, kill them all! But as, as they defeat him, it seems like some sort of mind control wears off on them, and it's like, what, what were we doing? What is going on? So... Early on, you think, oh, these Sky Bandits are the big villains, but there's someone behind them pulling the strings, and it just makes, like, as you go through the game, all these different plot twists, and who's really the bad guy, right? So you meet all sorts of other characters. Uh, later on, Olivier, who says, well, you, my, my favorite character, honestly, uh, who says he is just a, a wandering bard. He, he likes to go and, and drink and do all that good stuff. He meets Shara, falls in love with her. You can't really blame him. And, um, you know, there's more to him than meets the eye, that's for sure. Uh, later on, this young girl named Chloe, who says she's part of a, a school, and, you know, is, but again, there's more to meets the eye. Agate, who is also a bracer, who learned under Cassius, and looks down upon Estelle and Joshua, because he's like, oh, you rookies, what are you sticking your nose into this trouble for? I have a job to do, and, and kind of has, you know, the hard-ass attitude, but... He's softer than, than he lets on. The young Tita Russell, who is the granddaughter of Professor Russell, who again has connections to Cassius and to the greater story. And then also Zinn, the martial artist for the Republic of Calvert. So those are the playable characters. And another thing I really love about the game is as you go through all the chapters, you know, Estelle and Joshua are constantly in the party but everyone else comes and goes as the story dictates. You know, you'll have Shara and Olivier, then the chapter will end, Estelle and Joshua, oh, we got to continue our journey. But Shara and Olivier say, we're going to go back to uh, Roland and hang there for a while. So they leave the party, and then that makes way for Chloe to join the party. And then later on, as Estelle and Joshua are trying to pass through one of the gates, they're, they're staying the night and run into Agate, and these monsters start attacking the guardsmen, and when Agate finally joins the party, like, this is such great storytelling. Around the time, Estelle and Joshua are probably level 10, but Agate's level 25 or something like that. And he already has his S-Craft charged up and ready to go, so you can do a really powerful attack showing you how powerful Agate is in comparison to Junior Bracers, Estelle, and Joshua. You know, Tia joins the party later on. Zinn. And then once you get to the final dungeon... That's when you can customize your party and use whoever you want. So I like how the story makes it so 
you have these characters and they're here for a reason, but once we get to the final dungeon, the final bosses and all that, then th there's reason to use whatever party you want. And, and that was great storytelling in my opinion. But not only are the playable characters important, but all these side characters that constantly appear, you know, you have Niall and Dorothy, who you meet early on, Niall being the reporter for the Liberal newspaper and trying to get the scoop on everything. Uh, Dorothy, the photographer, who again helps us figure out who the big bad guys are at a certain point with her, uh, you know, I don't want to say she's dopey, but she's a bit clumsy, you know, and she sort of takes these photos inadvertently, but oh, they're important, <laughs> right? Uh, Professor Alba, <laughs> right? We'll save him more for the spoiler section, but this guy constantly appears, you know, when it's important for the plot, and he's like, oh, I'm just... Uh, an archaeologist, you know, I'll be doing my research here. No need to, to worry. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> you know, so he appears there. Um, Colonel Alan Richard of the Intelligence Department. The Kapua family, like I mentioned. Second Lieutenant Lawrence. Major Sid. And uh, just, just an incredible cast of characters. So another thing I really loved about the story is just how... You know, it starts out as a slice-of-life adventure, almost, where Estelle and Joshua are doing their odd jobs. But as you progress, things get more and more dark. Like, for instance, later on we meet a woman who runs an orphanage named Teresa. And the orphanage is burned down. Luckily, everyone survives. The children are all able to escape. But it's still pretty fucked up, man. And you think, oh, maybe it's the Sky Bandits did it. Maybe it's those ruffians we saw in the city of Ruan did it. But when it's revealed who the real culprit is, it's like, damn, they went down that road? Okay. More on that in the spoiler section. Uh, so now, might as well get into the combat. It's turn-based on a grid, and I love the combat, man. You have a turn order in the top left corner where it shows, like, which character's gonna attack, which enemy's gonna attack. Um, the way you cast spells is pretty interesting in that... You almost, you need two turns to cast a spell, like, you select it, and then once the next turn comes up, then the spell takes effect, and some enemies can disrupt that, cancel your, your spells, and, you know, it's, it's a lot of thinking involved. There is turbo mode, which I did use turbo mode against random encounters, just because at a certain point, you can get over level, I guess, and just spam attack, so no need to really worry about it, but anytime there was a boss going on, you definitely had to be on your toes, the bosses were more challenging, um, so skip turbo mode on that. You have the S-Crafts, which are so cool, man. So flashy, and, you know, you have, like, a really powerful one, but also less powerful ones. Like, the powerful ones use between 100 and 200 craft points, but the less powerful ones, you know, just a simple attack. And you want to charge them up to the, to the max potential and really go to town on the bosses there. And there is English voice acting with the character attacks, which I thought was interesting. And what a great cast of voice actors. I mean, you have Johnny Young Bosch as Joshua, Stephanie Shea as Estelle, which, man, how many times have Johnny Young Bosch and Stephanie Shea been paired up? I mean, Ichigo and Orihime, Renton and Areka, it goes on and on. Michelle Ruff as Sherizard, Troy Baker as Olivier, Christina V as Chloe. Bryce Pavenbrook as Agate, Julie Madalena as Tita, and Patrick Seitz as Zinn. And also for some of the non-playable characters, you have David Vincent as Colonel Alan Richard, Julie Ann Taylor as Josette, and a few others. Man, they, they really have got some great voice actors there. And I do believe at some point these characters do make their way into Trails of Cold Steel, and I think they do reprise their roles there, so... Some good stuff, just for battle quotes and grunts and things like that. <laughs> Very funny. So, you know, the battle system's great. I loved it. Let me show you the true essence of you. So as the game progresses, there's like so many memorable scenes and laugh out loud moments. In particular, one that comes to mind is when they meet Chloe and they agree to help her with the play, and Estelle, in the play, takes up the role as a knight, 
whereas Joshua becomes the princess, the damsel in distress, and it's just a funny scene where all the characters are like, oh, Joshua, you're so pretty, and he's getting all embarrassed. I thought that stuff was really funny. Uh, there's, like, more tropey stuff with hot springs and that whole deal. You, you have moments where, you know, the badass himself, Agate, is, you know, I'm so tough on this and that. He ends up defending Tita from, you know, these attacks from, from the enemies. And it's like, oh, he, he opened up his shell there. And you get a softer side to him where he's in the hospital and Tita's looking after him where he mumbles his younger sister's name. And, you know, there's kind of a relationship there where Agate sort of becomes the older brother figure to Tita because she doesn't have any other family members other than her grandfather. Uh, later on, you also have this, this moment where you infiltrate the castle and Estelle and Joshua dress up as maids. And it makes sense for Estelle, you know, because she's a girl. And they're like, oh, Joshua, you can do it. You dressed up as a princess earlier, so it's fine. So there's <laughs> some really cute stuff like that. Um, you know, just, just so much fun stuff. There's also early on, Shara and Olivier are having like a drink drink off. They're <laughs> it's like, oh, how much booze can you handle, boy? And, and Shara's drinking the whole bottle of wine and Olivier has a few sips and he's passed out. It's like, oh, no. <laughs> and she's constantly ridiculing him like, oh, you man up, will you? <laughs> so... Just such a great relationship between all these characters. I, I love to see them all grow and, and how some, you know, have, have this badass persona. They they really do lighten up as the game advances, like Agate in particular. Okay, so another thing I want to talk about is how much I love the music in this game. From the towns and how each town has its, its own different theme to the battle music. You have like your standard enemy battles, but also once characters get below a certain amount of HP, and even if a certain character dies, like say, you know, you have four party members, one character dies, it'll get more tense. The different boss fights, it's just such great music, man. And there's also the, the light motif of the main theme, which constantly plays throughout the game. Uh, Joshua has a harmonica where he plays the song. And then during the credits, you hear the song again, but with vocals. And really terrific song. So hopefully I, play, I edit here a few <laughs> snippets of the songs, but if not... I don't know.
Okay, so now it's time to talk some spoilers. So, it, for whatever reason, if you haven't played this game yet, click away now because I'm going to spoil things that I think you need to experience by playing the game firsthand. But if you don't care, then you don't care. You keep watching. <laughs> I'm just giving you the spoiler warning. So the big plot twists are the fact that Colonel Alan Richard is behind the coup d'etat. And he wants to overthrow Queen Alicia and seize control. For good reason, to a certain extent. Because after Cassius Bright left the military to look after his daughter and then Joshua's adopted son. There's really no one there to guide the military and... Alan Richard feels defenseless against the Erebonian Empire should they try to invade again. So he goes to the sealed chamber to, you know, use the black ornament and release all these seals and all this nonsense. But once our heroes confront him, he doesn't know why he did it. And it's revealed that he's being controlled by greater beings. And those greater beings end up being the secret society of... Ouroboros, which we meet two members of Ouroboros in this game, one of which being the second Lieutenant Lawrence, who, uh, that's not his real name, he's just posing as that. Uh, he takes off his helmet later on, revealed to be the silver-haired man who appeared throughout the game, known as one of the enforcers of Ouroboros. But that sweet, innocent Professor Alba turns out to be a member of Ouroboros as well, one of the seven snake apostles. And... He also reveals that Joshua was a puppet of his, known as Enforcer 13, the Black Fang. Which is interesting, because one of Joshua's S-crafts is called Black Fang. He was an assassin who was sent to murder Cassius Bright. But of course, a little boy stood no match to the Divine Blade himself. So Cassius stopped him, and Ouroboros was going to kill Joshua... But Cassius wasn't going to let that happen, so he decided to adopt the kid. And that's where you get the opening scene from the game of him bringing in the injured Joshua. Now, I'm a bit confused about this, if someone can elaborate in the comments. Because early on in the game, Joshua was revealing, or rather, he was saying to Estelle that he was going to reveal his past to her. So it seems like he knows some of his past. But once Wiseman says all this to him... It really hits home. So I feel like maybe Joshua knew some of it. He knew about the white-haired man and, and all that stuff. But he didn't know that he was like this killing machine, this assassin. And was, was sent to murder his adoptive father. So maybe, maybe that's where things sort of differ. But really great pot twist. And, and Weissman is like, oh, everything is going according to plan. So he's definitely going to play a larger role in second chapter, I have no doubts. But let me tell you, I didn't see that coming whatsoever. I mean, it was always kind of interesting how this Professor Alva shows up throughout the game. It's like, oh, let me help you, you children. And then it's like, fuck, he's the big bad guy? And, and it, it's so cool, too. Again, I mentioned earlier about how the, the characters all have different expressions. And he has, like, this, this sweet, innocent face in his portrait. But then once it's like, I'm Weissman, you see the evil look in his eyes. And it's like, oh, I should have known this fucker was evil from the beginning. But, um... Yeah, you know, he reveals all this stuff, and, and this is right before the end of the game where everyone's celebrating victory. Of course, you have the final bosses, which it started against Colonel Alan Richard. And after you defeated him, he sort of redeems himself because they fight this giant mechanical being called Reverie. Which, uh, <laughs> that's important to note because, of course, there's the game Trails into Reverie releasing soon. And I looked up what it meant, the definition, because I don't know what the fuck it means. And the definition says, a state of abstracted musing, daydreaming, a daydream, a state of mental abstraction in which more or less aimless fancy predominates over the reasoning faculty, dreaming meditation, fanciful musing. Uh, just something interesting to note, I thought. I, I, don't, I don't really know. It's just crazy that like a giant mech is called Reverie and there's the fucking game Trails into Reverie. But the boss is pretty difficult. Um... Not so much that... How should I say difficult? He has a lot of HP, we'll say. So, it takes a while. And you win, but then it's like, oh, we're gonna lose. And then fucking Cassius shows up, saves the day. He bit slaps Alan Richard like, What are you thinking, boy? What, what, do, you, what do you mean? Come on now. Not one man can, can change the fate of the, the world. And it's like, well, you kind of did in the Hundred Days War. But that's another story. So... You get, like, another phase. There's a couple of phases, but the last phase, Cassius wounds Reverie. It starts up again. 
except this time it only has 5,000 HP and all four of your party members have fully charged s craft So you just do your s crafts and kill them, and that's that. Another thing I forgot to mention, too, was about Olivier and how he's actually part of the Erebonian Empire. And you meet a character later on named Major Mueller Vander, who is in charge of looking after Olivier. And when he learns that he's been goofing off being this bard and all this stuff, he's like, what are you doing, you fool? <laughs> so there's so many funny scenes of that. Um, just some really good stuff. You have the martial arts tournament later on, where you meet the Sky Bandits, the Kapuas again, and they sort of are trying to redeem themselves. So I thought that was an interesting note. The airships, all sorts of great stuff. So the, with the closing scenes... Estelle and Joshua confront each other, and it's about time I address these things. And how, you know, I guess it may be controversial for some, but to me, I thought their relationship was very well done, and I, I love the two characters. But, obviously we established that Estelle is Cassius's daughter by blood, and Joshua is his adoptive son, so, you know, they're brother and sister. But as the game progresses, there's more to it than that, and they may actually be lovers. And pretty much all the characters insinuate this. Like, they'll say, are you two dating? Oh, it's young love. What is this? Oh. And, like, there's a scene where you're in a hot, a hot spring, and, and Tita says to Estelle, like, oh, is that your boyfriend? That's not my boyfriend. They're having all these arguments about it. But they love each other. And it's simple as that. And at the end, you know, Joshua's playing his harmonica, and Estelle approaches him, and lets it all out where you also have joshua revealing his dark past and estelle saying like what are you what are you talking about you know we've been together through so much you're nothing like that and you know she confesses that she loves him uh, but but and joshua gives her a kiss laced with a sedative to make her pass out so he can go on his, his own way and figure out his dark past and what the deal is of ouroboros so a really emotional ending. I actually cried uh, both during that scene and also during the credits as like the music was playing with the vocal track and also after the credits finished there's Trails in the Sky next you know the preview for second chapter and just the music playing with that. I'm gonna clip that at the end of this video if you want to watch that for yourself. Another thing I wanted to mention for the spoilers is the fact that during the Hundred Days War Estelle lost her mother, which is why early on, you know, you see it's just Cassius looking after Estelle and Joshua. Uh, but she lost her mother, and as the war was taking place, rubble was falling down, and Estelle's mother shielded her daughter and took her own life, sacrificed herself to save her daughter. So I thought that was a really beautiful scene, and I mentioned before how I did cry during certain scenes. I, I did get a little teary-eyed there, and it's like, oh, poor, poor Estelle. So I absolutely loved The Legend of Heroes Trails in the Sky first chapter. It was a fantastic experience. I laughed, I cried, I did it all, man. It's, it's just fantastic. And this being the first game in the series and seeing some discourse online, everyone's like, oh, it's kind of slow. You know, it's the prologue. Once you get through that, then things start to get better. And I will admit, you know, the last two hours of the game, it's like, damn, <laughs> let's see where this is going to go. But I like the slow build of it, seeing all the characters grow and, and their motivations and, and how they're all connected to each other. I'm really curious to see what happens next. Uh, as far as making a prediction, you know, because Estelle and Joshua are going their separate ways, if I had to guess, I would say, what if, like, you do a chapter, you play as Estelle, and then the next chapter you play as Joshua or something like that, and then they converge in the end or maybe the halfway point? I don't know, because after you beat the game, it, it says, you know, Estelle is left with Joshua's harmonica and, and seeks him out while Joshua goes his own way. So Joshua is trying to get to the bottom of Ouroboros, but Estelle is looking for him. So maybe maybe they'll do, because even in this game, once you got to the end of a chapter, there'd be, you know, 20 minutes of more dialogue and, and stuff. Like you'd see Richard, you'd see um, other characters scheming and, and the whole nine yards. So maybe they'll do that. They'll do end of the chapter, then Joshua's doing this or whatever. I'm very curious. So like I said early on... Um, 
I'm not, I haven't started it yet, but by the time this video goes up, I'll probably have started <laughs> second chapter. So stay tuned for that really soon. I hope you enjoyed this video because I decided to do something a little different with editing. And, you know, in most cases it's me on the camera just parting things out. But I figured I want to do something special with this because it really was a special game. And I look forward to, to diving deeper into the series. And, you know, maybe a year from now, we'll have the Trails of Cold Steel video. But, yeah, I'm planning to go through it. Not necessarily marathon it, but play a game, take a break. Play the next game, take a break. Because I have heard you can get burned out because of all the dialogue. Uh, but I love the dialogue, so who knows what's going to happen. Either way, I guess I'm now a full-fledged Trails fan. So, thank you guys so much for watching. Let me know what you thought in the comments down below. And stay tuned for more videos coming soon. Peace out.